Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern bar cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick, and thanks for joining us for another really special interview episode. This week, I sit down and chat with DC bartender Chantal Seng to learn all about the strange and wonderful world of sherry and sherry cocktails. Now, admittedly, sherry isn't the most common cocktail ingredient these days. It's a member of the fortified wine family, right alongside vermouths, ports, and Madeiras. And, I mean, really the most popular references to this beverage are on reruns of Frasier, when Kelsey Grammer periodically turns to David Hyde Pierce and offers him a small glass of sherry, saying, Sherry Niles? And I, that's really, you know, where we come across it most is on those reruns. But beyond knowing it's some sort of alcoholic drink, most of us don't really know a thing about sherry. And that is precisely what we'll set out to correct in this episode. But first... I think it's time for you to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is the Bamboo Cocktail. And this is a drink that we will definitely talk about at length later on in the episode. Now, if you recall our vermouth interview with Kat Hamidi of Capitoline Vermouth, we spoke about one of her very favorite cocktails, which is the Adonis which is also a drink that contains both vermouth and sherry. The difference between the Adonis and the bamboo is basically the difference between a Manhattan and a martini. And what I mean by this is that Manhattans tend to be dark, rich, and sweet, while martinis tend to be dry and refreshing, even though both drinks tend to follow a pretty similar measurement paradigm when it comes to ingredient ratios. So let's look at how to make the bamboo cocktail. To make this drink, you're gonna need an ounce and a half of fino sherry, which is a type of dry sherry that we'll kind of explain later on in the episode. You also need an ounce and a half of dry vermouth and several dashes of orange bitters. And this recipe comes to us from punch.com. So to prepare the drink, you combine these ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, you stir until it's well mixed and chilled, strain it into a stemmed cocktail glass, either a coupe or one of those traditional Art Deco V-shaped martini glasses, and then you garnish with a nice orange twist. As usual with cocktails that only have a few ingredients, the bitters are where you can start to personalize. So orange bitters are traditional for this drink, like they are for a martini, but there's nobody stopping you from subbing in a different type of bitters in place of the orange if the occasion or your mood kind of indicates that that would be a good idea. So play around with those and back to this week's interview. During this really fun discussion with Chantal Singh, some of the things we cover include the popular types of sherry or styles and what sets them apart from one another, the production methods and terroir unique to the sherry producing communities in southern Spain, sherry vocab terms en español, as well as a quick crash course in the shorthand that sherry producers and blenders write on their barrels. The best sherry cocktails, of course, to serve at your next gathering or cocktail party. Why you might want to grab a drink with Edgar Allan Poe, and much, much more. Chantal is an amazing host and mixologist, so I really do hope that some of you make a pilgrimage to the Petworth Citizen and Reading Room here in Washington, D.C., where we recorded this episode, and pull up a seat for her Literary Cocktails series, which she'll tell us more about later on in this episode. So without further ado, please enjoy this audio ode to Sherry with my friend, Chantal Singh. Chantal, thanks for being on the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, so we are here today to speak about sherry, which is a really interesting and really complex topic in the cocktail world, and is one with a lot of history, and you just have 
an amazing share your resume. So I'm excited to hear all about that. And uh, I was hoping you could just start by telling folks who you are, what you do, and uh, just a brief bio. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, my name is Chantal Sang. I am a a uh, bartender by mostly trade and part-time psalm and sherry specialist. I, um, I teach sherry classes. I make a lot of sherry cocktails at my current job, bartending in the reading room of Petworth Citizen, where I run a program called Literary Cocktails. I read a book every week and then create a cocktail menu around it. And through that, you'll find a lot of sherry cocktails make on the menu. And also that a lot of sherry gets mentioned in a lot of books. <laughs> Interesting. What kind of books, like... Uh I feel like sherry, like at least today, is not one of the most popular spirits or mixers. So what kind of books are you finding sherry mentions in? In a lot of classics. Most recently, I just finished reading The House of the Spirits by Isabel Allende, and there's a scene drinking sherry. But it also comes up in some more contemporary novels that you just don't expect, and it's just a very simple line, oh, we had a glass of sherry or something. But it's kind of cool. I always try to make note of when that happens. Like <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it would make sense for us to go back in time a little bit and talk about when you first encountered Sherry and, and thought that it, it was interesting and then started to learn mm -hmm. more about it. Oh, sure. So I have been bartending in the city f since 2000, and I think somewhere in the mid-2000s, we had Sherry um, at a dinner, at a private dinner in, at Comey Restaurant, and we were doing... We were hosting like the winemaker from La Gitana, and I remember tasting different types of sherries, very dry sherries that I'd never had before, and pairing it with Greek food. And kind of around the same time, I'd also been making more vintage cocktails and bringing cocktails back out of the books and finding a lot of sherry cocktails and trying the Adonis and kind of thinking, oh, this is amazing. I've never tasted a cocktail like this before in my life. And that kind of sort of started the whole Hmm, I must know more. <laughs> so that was somewhere in the mid 2000s. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So what did you do once you got that little spark of interest? How did you go about learning more? Oh, okay. Um, well, through I was also in a tasting group um studying for my my psalm degree, if you will, through became eventually becoming a certified sommelier. So there are classes and like specialty uh, lectures and there's tastings and people that come in town and when you're in part of the industry the wine world you know you're always up on to speed of who is in town or who's lecturing in this or what to taste and then once you taste sherry you also ask your distributors and it's like hey tell me more about this the other nice thing is that the bar that I was also working at during that time had sherry behind the bar and they just had had sherry behind the bar before I even worked there so that was always oh what's this back here let me try mm. that and it be, kind of became my shift drink of course yeah, <laughs> that's a nice nice way to kind of fall into it. So before we get into too much, I know that you've traveled. You've done some some travel uh, uh, for around Sherry, and, and that's something I'm really interested to, to hear about. But I'm hoping that maybe we can start with a quick working definition of what Sherry is for our listeners, because it's a, it's a little bit different. Um, and And specifically, I'm interested in learning how and where it branches off from other fortified wines like vermouths and Madeiras, for example. Sure. So sherry is a uh, fortified wine from a very specific region in southern Spain. Uh, it, has a, it has a good 3,000 years of history in that region making wine um, continuously. They've always made wine in this area. Um, it's very driven by this, this place and the terroir and the climate and um, history obviously, and people. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so there's a large range of the different types of sherry. Um, typically, well, as of today, in the modern version of sherry, which started in the 1800s when the Solera system was developed, you can span from a very, very dry, light, around 15% wine, to a very rich and viscous um, sweet dessert wine. The, um, the difference is... Well, once our time and place, right? Um, sherry is made a very specific way. There's a blending method, creates a non-vintage style to keep consistency. There's the decisions along the way of after harvest, what happens to the different mustos? Do they pursue a different type of category? So in that, are they going to let this floor live and help 
char- characterize and create and change the wine and then to create a biologically aged style, which would be a Manzanier or a Fino, or are they also going to create that and then let it become an Amontillado, which is where they start letting it oxidize, or do they not at all have any floor aging and then go for the oxidatively aged route, which is an Oloroso, and then there's also other categories, or do they just completely decide we're going to make these sweet sherries? So there's like decisions, decisions, decisions. There's so many, so many things that make sherry sherry that are like so complicated. But once again, it has to be from there. So I, most people are familiar with, oh, it's not champagne unless it's from Champagne in France. It's actually very, very true in the same thing. There are some laws in different countries that don't um, adhere to that. But it's a shame because it really makes a difference when you taste um, the attempts at other people trying to create the same style in other parts of the world. Like in the U.S., it's just it's it's radically different. I don't even it's just no contest. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Wow. So you threw out, we, we've got a, one of my questions um, definitely uh, pertains to some of these vocab terms that you threw out. Um, so we'll get, we'll get there. So oh, sorry. It, no, <laughs> d- no, don't worry about it. It's, it's almost impossible to talk about without, you know, in any specificity without referencing some of these things. Uh, so if you listeners, if you heard something that doesn't necessarily make a, a whole lot of sense, we'll probably go back and define it. Um, can we talk about like the big types that people will probably see in liquor stores? So, so like if they go to their local liquor store that that carries sherries, um, mm-hmm. what are they gonna what are they gonna find on the labels? Mostly, just at any liquor store, um, it's hard to find like really really good sherry unless that liquor store you know has particularly has an affinity or has a customer base. So the easiest thing you'll find is something along the lines of like a richer creamer sh- cream sherry or a sweeter Oloroso, or you'll find some of the, the low-end Amontillados. You might find Finos and Manzanillas, but it's it's more rare that you will find them. But those are also the everyday drinking styles, the ones that once you start ordering them, that you find that this is something you can drink more often. You have a relationship with your wine store. Um, so something like Williams and Humbert, I've seen like Sandeman's makes um, a few sherries that are on the richer side. I mean, this is what you normally find. But there, once again, there are other places that have, particularly in the local DC area, that carry carry a nice range from Lustau. That'll carry a range from Hidalgo La Gitana, which and their secondary line Alessandro. And those are the ones I see most often on the shelves. In addition to like Tio Pepe from Gonzalez Baez. Yeah, and so in terms of the the styles. Uh, I'll tell you the way that I usually think about it, and you tell me if they're if, if it's right, wrong, maybe maybe some distinctions to be made. But when I think of sherry, like a dry sherry, I think of a fino, uh-huh. and then um, there's the, the manzanilla that you mentioned is sort of an offshoot of fino. Is that correct? I mean, yes, as in they're made the same way, but because they're in geographic different geographically different places, where manzanilla is called manzanilla because while the wine gets pursued in the same way of living under floor, it gets aged in this one town, one specific town called San Lucar de Barrameda, and it's just a coastal town, and just the nature of the yeast that lives in the wine just is different, and it Mm kind of creates a much lighter, brighter, even more floral style, and so those are called manzanilla. So they tend to be even drier than finos, more crisp, but it really depends on the producer. Right. Okay, so Fino and Manzanilla are going to be your dry options. As you mentioned, these are probably going to be lower in ABV in many cases and easy to sip like in late afternoon as kind of like, um, you know, an aperitivo style thing, right? Sure, yeah. There will be 15%. Typically, there are some exceptions and you'd serve them chilled. Um, nice. There are other dry st- styles that would continue, but those are like the most crisp of the dry styles. Got it. So... Um, then kind of moving in a little bit more of a, a rich direction, uh, we've got Amontillados, is that correct? So Amontillados would be the next category. Basically, they're like the older version of a Fino or a, Mon- or a Manzanilla. Okay. Um, and are those, I, I, you threw out a term that was not on my list, so I'm going to hit it now. Oxidate, oxidation. Um, right. Does that mean barrel aging or simply exposing it to air? It's um, it's controlled exposure to air. So obviously, a lot of times when someone hears the term oxidative or oxidized, that sounds like oh no, that's bad in in the wine world, right? There is a controlled uh, oxidative aging, and it's actually very natural. When I say controlled, it's not like with buttons and levers. It's more, all right, let's see how the wine is doing, and now it and, and it engages with the air in barrel which are old barrels there's not really like new barrel or anything like that going on and how it engages and evolves over time in that 
Okay. So Amontillado is aged in a barrel. Um, All styles are, including the Finos and Manzanillas. Okay. All sherry has to be aged in barrels. Got it, got it. But the barrels, like, so unlike an American bourbon, for example, where it's required that they be aged in new charred oak barrels, these, the barrels uh, used in aging sherry don't have that specific type of requirement? Uh, no, they have, they have requirements. They actually have a ton of requirements. And what is the general, like, I don't know if I, I even say like 99% of the case are American barrels that are heavily, heavily used that don't offer, there's no new, new oak whatsoever. Or if new oak barrels are purchased, they get used to make other things like brandies or maybe vinegars or something to, to wear them down over time and reduce the new oakness. Okay. Yeah, that does, that, that does sound rather, uh, rather strict. Um, in, it, in its own way, and it's kind of like the opposite way of only being able to use you uh, a single use, you know, charred oak. That's that's interesting. And, and then at the very end, maybe not at the very end, but then going in an even richer direction after um, Amontillado, you have Oloroso. Right. You have Olorosos and also Palo Cortados. Okay. Uh, and what's the difference between those? It's um, it's a, it's a very. Sp- special way that the Consejo Regulador describes the difference because of Palo Cortado by technical definition is a little bit more vague rather than the definition they give for an Amontillado or an Oloroso. But a Palo Cortado is supposed to have the aromatic or nose character of an Amontillado but the richness of an Oloroso. So it's a very vague definition but essentially what it means is that while the Amontillado is an older Fino Amanzanilla, it's lived under floor for what average time, um, at least three to five years, and oftentimes longer. The Palo Cortado sometimes also has that, and sometimes it doesn't. The Oloroso doesn't have any floor aging, but a Palo Cortado usually, in this day and age, for it to be consistently created, gets made from... This is another technical fun side to Sherry. When you're making decisions about how to pursue which style, there are these different mustos, like they'll taste and the first harvest and they'll taste and smell the grape juice and they'll go, oh, this one's really fragrant and that usually gets made into a Fino Manzanilla. Or they'll go, this is fragrant and we're going to pursue a Palo Cortado with this eventually because they know they're using the extra fragrant must. Interesting. Yeah, let's um, dig in for a second to the actual juice that's used to to make sherry. Um, Is there a particular type of grape that's used? Yes. For all dry sherries, the grape is called Palomino Fino. Um, and Palomino is the typical, what you would just say, Palomino. And it is a white grape, so all sherries are made from white grapes. There are two other grapes that get used for the dessert styles, which are Muscatel and Pedro Jimenez, or PX for short. Okay. Interesting. And you mentioned this term, the musto, or the musto. Oh, yeah. Uh, what what is is that just does that just mean the pressed uh, non-alcoholic grape juice it, uh, so in sherry country it means both like that and it also means after the fermentation it's still considered musto so they use the term for both stages it's different some they don't use do that in other wine regions necessarily and some of them do interesting really interesting okay uh, and is there any anything special about you know the way that these grapes are grown uh, the thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, different wine regions around the world have different practices concerning like the way that they treat the the vines themselves. Um, and, and I know that you mentioned terroir earlier. So I, w- I was wondering if there's anything either on the human side of things or perhaps on the land, the terroir side of things that really ends up affecting the end product. Oh, yes. So on the land side of things, what's really fascinating about this particular area in southern Spain, which I should mention is composed of three main towns, Jerez de la Frontera, where the name Sherry comes from. Jerez is Sherry. El Puerto de Santa Maria, it's a port town, and then San Lucar de Barrameda, which is the coastal town. They kind of creates this triangle. And in this region, there's all these subregions for where the grapes get grown. In those towns, that's where the Sherry has to be aged, but in the vineyards are all around. And the land of those vineyards are very, very uh, composed. I'm sorry, there's a lot of chalk in the soil, right? So in other wine regions going, if you think about Chablis and their Camerigian soils, which are full of limestone and chalk, there's this continental shelf that is part that like starts up in like Dover, like London, uh-huh. and that goes through Chablis and Camerigian, and it actually ends down in the south of Spain. And so there's all this amazing chalk limestone soil right there, and it's the same I shouldn't say same because it's soil, it's different everywhere you go, terroir is different everywhere you go, Mm -hmm. but it's that soil that is in this region, which is why the grapes do really well, and that's a huge, huge marker for 
the land. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then for people, there there are different things that they do. They have um, in the vines, in the vineyards themselves, they're not allowed to irrigate. So you are in southern Spain, which is pretty hot and sunny. You know, they don't have a lot of rainfall, except mostly in the rainy season, which is, you know, in the winter and then early spring. And then in summer, it gets really dry. So what's nice about that soil is that the way it cakes is that when it does rain and the rain just goes into the soil and goes down deep, then when the sun comes out, it kind of cakes the top. So it kind of locks the, like creates its own natural wells of water, but they're really far down. And that encourages the vines to go very deep to get to the water, which makes them stronger. And therefore the rule is that they make better grapes. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yeah. This is something that the people in Bordeaux are very, uh, you know, very, very proud of. Or when, you know, when they talk about their their left bank cabs, you know, the gravelly, mm-hmm. the gravelly soil forces the roots <laughs> to go deep. So yes. that's that's really cool. I did not know that a uh, little geological deposit that ran, that runs from Dover to um, to the, the southern part of Spain. Uh, yeah, it's called Alberiza. Alberiza. Alberiza is the soil with all the chalk in it. Nice. There's a, a blend, and there's different Alberizas in different areas, right? And there's all a little bit of a blend of that. And then the two other soils are called arenas and barros. And they're like different sandy clay, this and that. And it just, I know one winemaker down there is really into the soil samples. So I have to give him a shout out and say that that exists. Nice. (laughs) What's his name? Oh, I think uh, Ramiro Ibanez. Nice. And then free me. I I don't actually speak Spanish, so I'm sure I I butchered pronunciations all the time. Well, shout out, shout out to him. (laughs) It's it's official. Uh, You're on the Modern Bar Cart podcast. (laughs) Okay. So we've talked kind of production methods we've talked a little bit about the the differences in the the flavors between them and i was hoping we could uh, use some of the terms uh, and maybe talk about some of your experiences that you've had down there because some of these these um these definitions here i've I've actually i I picked them after after seeing some some pictures that you posted after after some of your trips so (laughs) um okay uh, term number one, we've mentioned it before, Solera. What is the Solera method? And it's, it sounds like there's some connection between the Solera method and modern sherry, sherry as we know it. Right. So modern sherry as we know it, it cannot be called sherry until it goes through the Solera system. So the Solera system is essentially a fractional blending wine aging system. And it's just barrels, different tiers of barrels. Now, the Solera, the word itself, refers to the barrel that ends up containing what you end up bottling from. So the Solera has the oldest mix, the longest it's been going, it's ready to go, that's where you bottle from. And then there's different tiers, different levels called Criaderas, and depending on the wine they're making, they'll have three, they'll have 15. And so they often are stacked on top of each other, or they're just stacked in different areas of the warehousing of where they're aging. Um, and it's a blend, fractional blending. So let's say you bottle, and at most you can never you can never take out a third of a barrel because you can never you can't empty a barrel ever. So it's always okay. fractional. A third is a lot. You don't have to take out a third, but let's say they take out a third and bottle that. Then the next tier, um, the um, first Criadera, they'll take out out of that and put it into the Solera. And then from that, they'll take the second Criadera, add it to the first, the third to the second, the fourth, what you know, and so on and so on. Okay. And so it rotates. And so wine is constantly being blended non-vintage. Before, before entering, it's called the sober tabla, and that's basically wine from the harvest of the year. Okay. That they figured out where it's going, and then to which the system, this is the Fino Solera for Valdespinos Innocente, right? So then they designate what goes, that sober tabla, which goes there, and they have a whole system, and everything's recorded, and it's very organized. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> I imagine you would have to be very organized to be able to track all of that. Um, interesting question. Uh, do they write an, anything on the barrels to indicate what's what's going on? Because I I've, I've seen you know obviously facilities here in D.C. other where other places where spirits are aging, you always see stuff written on the barrels. But in a Solera system, I imagine that gets real crazy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they they do. They always because so the person who is going around making sure each barrel is like good to go because every now and then they're tasting. Um, tasting under the floor wines, on the non-floor wines, and going, all right, where is this at? Is this good to be blended? If not, they'll have like some kind of code with chalk, and they'll be, you know, maybe it's an X for a reason, maybe it's a, a letter that means something, or maybe there's, um, they'll say with there's like an at symbol that require that gives you a certain volume of how much they took out. They'll be like, oh, three at, and that'll mean a certain thing, 
or it, it kind of changes, but I, I'm forgetting right now because I'm not super remembering what that exact amount roughly is, and I forget the name for it, but... Or they'll also just designate, oh, okay, we tried this, this is becoming a Palo Cortado, and they'll take the symbol that is there and they'll stick a cross on it, right? And it'll be like a stick is a Fino, a circle is an Oloroso. So they have tons, tons of pictograms and languages, and they are unique to each bodega, too. Some, uh. of, them, some of them have a lot in common, like the, the stick means Fino, and the zero, or the O, not zero, means Oloroso, and then the cut stick means Apollo Cortado. Those are pretty common, and those have gone forever, but then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. That's a, <laughs> so there's like this fascinating visual vernacular that is oh that's that that's awesome I'm I, I never knew and I just kind of suspected based on the way that you explained the solera that there was something going on where these people are communicating with each other that's really fascinating I I would love to stick on that but I'll get way too into the weeds on it so let's <laughs> let's move on to another term here um, you've been mentioning floor a lot um, and this is an important kind of quasi uh, terroir thing in that it, it relates to living things that affect the wine. Um, so can you tell us what flor is, F-L-O-R? Yes, so flor, which translates to flower, is the localized um, assortment of these yeasts that live on your wine. So flor is a, it very naturally occurs in, in the wines that are of a certain alcoholic degree and what they do is these yeasts kind of coat the phenos and the manzanillas and protect it from oxygen. So you'll notice that when you have a pheno or a manzanilla, it looks nice, like ye yellow or pale gold. looks like a white wine because mm -hmm. it is white wine. All sherry is white wine. Right. But because it's not oxidized, it actually retains that same hue. So flora is this living yeast feeding off of the sugar um, and then adding in the process other aromatics and other types of characteristics. Mm -hmm. Now the floor will be a breakup of different Saccharomyces yeasts um, depending where you are. I had mentioned earlier in the town of San Lucar de Barrameda the floor blend is a little different and it's very strong there because they love that sea wind um, and it changes the character but overall it, what it does is it makes a very very dry wine with a lot of extra character with a lot of aromatic volatile compounds and the personality of phenos and manzanillas Let's see. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so it's just kind of floating on top in the like ferment. a blanket. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and is this in the you know like a wood vat, like a large wooden vat? It's in casks. So botas is what they are called, sherry okay. botas. They're um, casks. Okay. <laughs> so you like 500, 600 liters. Uh, for these casks, they're never all the way filled. Mm. So usually there's a good maybe five, six are filled so that you have that air to have the yeast survive because they it. need to breathe. But they also are eating the sugar, keeping eating the oxygen. So the oxygen's not going to the wine, mm -hmm. coating it like a blanket. And however, and then those go through cycles. You know, they have essentially they have kids, grandkids, great grandkids, and yeah. then eventually they die off. And then when they die off, it's kind of like this understanding that needs to be oh, it's ready for bottling. Um, and that's over a few years after they've also been blended through the Solar system or or they let it keep going and then start to interact with air and become an Amontillado. Interesting. Okay, so when a sherry producer or a blender wants to taste a Fino or a Manzanilla that does have the floor on it, do they have to like break through? Is it like a crust? I don't even know. They um yeah, there's this basic this layer of yeast, and so there's a tool called a venencia. Okay, and, and that's one of our <laughs> other that's one of our other terms. Yeah, so the hole, the hole in the barrel, um, which usually sits on top, so that when you go to the barrel, you can take out the cap and you can plunge what is basically a large a long wand with a, a cup at the end. Um, there's two, you'll see two kinds mainly. One's called a cane, which is mostly in San Lucar de Barmeda, and it's with a lighter, lightweight kind of cane uh, material. Or there's this sort of steel, and it's much more wand-like, and it's more modern, and it, it's a cup. And so it's a little rounded on the bottom. It's a really thin cup. It goes, you just push it down, and it punctures the floor. And when you pull it back up, it pulls the floor back together. I see. Okay. And then you pour out of the cup as you pull it. A Venencia door is someone who pours from a Venencia, and you just you aerate it. So when you're tasting the wine, you're also aerating it, so you can t taste the aroma and smell and see how it's going. Because everything's sort of sleeping. It's all these little nurseries. Each. So the term criadera, which is mentioned before, the different tiers, it translates to nursery. 
and so you have all these sleeping barrels and you like you check in and then you put the blanket back on oh man that is <laughs> that's too cute uh, i know <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, let me make sure i'm saying it correctly the venencia door uh, this is one of those pictures or videos that I saw a while back on, on that you posted on social media that I really enjoyed because there's a bit of theatrics to this, is there not? Oh, yes. It is its own art form. It's fun. It's yeah. because you could make a mess easily, and therefore it's fun when you learn how to pour it. You pra it's good to practice with water and other, other non you know, dirty liquids. Right. <laughs> um, so what, what I'll try and do is, uh, I, I don't know where one is located, uh, but I'll try and at the very least find a picture or maybe a video on YouTube of somebody uh, Venencia Doring. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, it's really cool. Basically, if anybody listening has ever seen a bartender who was, um, you know, started pouring, you know, maybe a shot or some, you know, some straight whiskey on the rocks, and they've got that pour spout on the bottle. And as they pour, they kind of raise the bottle to a, a very unnecessary height as they continue to pour. There's, it's kind of like that, except even more extreme, right? Right. I mean, it's wine, it's opening the wine up, it's it's just like at aerating, so that's the whole process. It's a tool designed so practically for this exact purpose. So, so you've <laughs> literally got somebody who's like holding like one or two, one or more shit, like little tasting glasses out at arm's length. And then they're kind of with their other hand holding this kind of wand and just air and, you know, doing the kind of same, same motion that I just described. Correct. Correct. I mean, you can use one glass, you can use two or three. If, if you're showing off at a yeah. trade show, you can have like five in your hands and wear the cool jacket. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. This is to me, this is like the, um, it's a, a much more utilitarian take on savoring the champagne. It looks cool, <laughs> but there's actually a purpose to it, right? Right, right. And, and aerating, so it's, it seems like one of the themes that we're encountering right now is oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oxygen, the extent to which oxygen interacts with sherry is uh, what affects, in, in a way, the different styles. And then also when you go to taste sherry, because it's not a straight spirit and because it's, um, you know, uh, in many cases, a more delicate, a, a grape based product, adding the air to the equation, um, is, is really important. So w when you think back to the five S's of tasting, see swirl, then sniff, swish and spit the swirling that, you know, that's that same function of opening it up. So that's, that's important, right? Yeah, exactly. They just have their own flair for it. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so we hit a bunch of those terms. Are there any other terms that uh people should know about sherry or any other stories that uh that you have from when you went there that that are particularly um you know interesting or resonant so many i mean i guess i didn't really touch on the fortified side of it that much and it, uh, and okay. it is pretty important in the character and style of sherry because um once again fino's manzanias are, are fortified and they're all fortified, but when that first decision, you fortify to 15% or 17%. And as an ineological tool, as a device to either encourage or discourage the growth of the floor. And so it's very important to the character share. I didn't really touch on that. So that's mm. kind of important. Yeah. Um, and the fortification is adding spirit, right? So the spirit is essentially um, like it basically is a brandy right mm -hmm. but not necessarily alcohol not necessarily cask aged but it's just like a, a distillate mm -hmm. essentially yeah like an eau de vie uh, grappa style type thing uh, from grapes typically yeah. but sometimes not it depends but okay. it's just a very neutral spirit so it's almost like a binary decision between 15 and 17 percent it's like a zero or a one that you'll tell a computer right it's like at 15 right. it's clearly this and then if we just simply up that alcohol percentage to 17 percent then what's going to necessarily happen is the environment is not going to be conducive for yeast growth right exactly which is um so very fascinating and many different nuances in there because well once you decide which way you're going you also want to maintain that level so if you have floor living in your wine the floor is going to also eat alcohol a little bit too, in mm. addition to the sugar. No, Fleur is very special. Fleur has like all kinds of unique characteristics. In fact, the reason why Fleur is Fleur is that if you leave anything out, you know how things just appear, like yeasts and other types of fungus will happen. But 
at 15%, there's only one strain or particular grouping strain of yeast that actually is the one that you want in your wine. So under 15%, other things might happen. Things might go bad. 15 cent is perfect for floor. And then it kind of does well and thrives in a good range. Even, I think even up to 16, 16, 5 maybe. But at 17, the floor doesn't. It's like, oh, that's too much alcohol for me. Right, right. Really, really fascinating. Okay, so it seems like sherry, like so many things in the cocktail world, is one of these things that there's dozens of little rabbit holes. And, and as you get increasingly nuanced and more local, the rabbit holes get bigger, cooler, and, and more bizarre, mm-hmm. uh, which leads to great relationships, as, as you've learned. But um, I wanted to, before we jump into the lightning round, make sure we give the sherry cocktails a good uh, kind of going through. You mentioned one of them earlier, which is the Adonis. Um, so would we be able to like maybe start with the Adonis and hit a, hit a couple of really important sherry cocktails for folks? Sure. I mean, I always think about the classics like the Adonis and the bamboo and something very simple like a cherubita. Um, and the best way to describe them is the Adonis is a sherry Manhattan and the bamboo is a sherry martini. So you you essentially mix them and I have to say that when you go through all the sherry cocktail books, you don't get a lot of consistency. You, you kind of find, yes, there's sherry and vermouth and bitters, but the proportions change all over the place. And the style of sherry, sometimes it's not specified. So mm. how I make the Adonis might be different, and I'm pretty sure is different from how a lot of other bartenders make the Adonis. We all kind of develop our own favorite sherry or go-to or yeah. you know preference or favorite vermouth go-to or preference and bitters go-to and preference, which is exciting because... You make bitters. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I love what you're saying about the kind of signature aspect of, of cocktails like that, where uh, there's a little bit of room. And so when you go to the reading room and get an Adonis from Chantal, it's the you know, Chantal's take on that. And it, ta- it may taste very different than uh, something you get somewhere else. So what is your your unique version? Well, for the Adonis, I'll, I like to use Montiato. Um, I know a lot of bartenders like to use Oloroso. Um, I just have quite a penchant for Amontillado, and I typically I've done I've used Lustalo some Arcos Amontillado. I use um, Tio Diego Val, Valdespinos Tio Diego Amontillado. Um, I've used Grant uh, Amontillado the La Grocha. Those are the three that I find I like using for that cocktail. But there, I mean, it works with others, and you can always play around. Mm-hmm. And I'll I'll do like a two to one with a Dolan Rouge sweet vermouth and add like some aromatic bitters you can also add orange bitters to that and then just stir rice strain garnish with an orange peel Mm. and it's just delicious it's just all those ingredients sherry and vermouth are like kissing cousins you know they're they always go well together (laughs) um the bamboo is the the one that you said was more like a martini correct right so the way i like to think about the bamboo is you would take a drier sherry like a fino or a manzanilla and mix with dry vermouth. Mm. And you once again, you could do two to one. Is my classic go-to for that. And orange bitters stirred with like a lemon peel. And there are other bartenders who have many, many different riffs on that. And some who don't use Fino or Manzanilla. And they use a Montiato Oloroso as well. So mm-hmm. that would completely change the character. I like the Fino Manzanilla route. It makes me think this is more like a martini. Right, right. <laughs> and if you, if you were to go Manzanilla, then it's almost, or um, rather Amontillado, it would be more like a barrel aged gin martini, you know, sure. similar to that. Yeah. And then there's, and plus there's just so much range in different styles. Like if you used um, a special category we didn't talk about, which is like a Fino Amontillado, which isn't a real category, but it's kind of like, Becoming an Afino, becoming an Amontillado, but not going to full Amontillado. <laughs> not going full Monty. I love it. Uh, <laughs> so a little, a little oxidation in there, other way. In other right, words. a little bit, and so that one still retains all this Fino character. Or same thing with a Manzanilla Passata, which is made similarly. Then you have a little bit more of that kind of nuttiness going on, but it still doesn't go full oxidized, and so that's interesting too. Other bartenders will also rinse. They'll like. Rinse the glass with Oloroso, but make it with Fino. Ooh. You know, things like fun things. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I like that. I like the glass rinse when it comes to richer things. You know, usually we very 
you know, we, we usually hear the glass rinse of when it comes to like a very dry martini or an absinthe based cocktail, like a Sazerac. Right. But I like it with, uh, I, I really haven't experimented doing it with something that's maybe a little richer and sweeter, like an Oloroso. Mm-hmm. Cool little, cool little trick to try out <laughs> at home. Um, I hear oftentimes in the classic cocktail canon about a cocktail called the Sherry Cobbler. Yay, I was just going to mention that. Nice. <laughs> Can you please explain that? Because I a lot of the cocktails and stories from Imbibe that David Wondrich so wonderfully puts out there in the world are you know very vivid in my mind and i know that the sherry cobbler is in there i just i can't remember it so can you refresh my and our collective memory sure so the term cobbler it's kind of like a category in itself right so something is like a julep is a cobbler is a a toddy is a sling Mm -hmm. is a it's a style it's a or a cup a cooling cup right um so for a sherry cobbler it just means uh, a sherry that's sweetened or maybe it's just a sweet sherry. You could also sweeten it with um, sugar or honey or other sweeteners. Mm-hmm. And then served over crushed or cracked ice. Usually crushed ice works similar like you would imagine a julep. Okay. And also served with like fresh fruits. So you would have like fresh fruits, maybe mint and herbs. I, I like definitely the mint in there. Um, and then whatever's in season. So if it's in the fall, I've, I've pulled out like persimmons. I've pulled out other types of sweeteners and even involve a little maple if in the spring you know lots of berries strawberries are going are perfect right now they're sure. so delicious so it's, it's just so classic and you and you drink it with a straw ideally a biodegradable straw or a yeah. steel straw yeah exactly <laughs> um well that's that's an that's an interesting drink and i i love um i think one of the things that i've been doing more and more often is going back and doing a little bit of historical reading on some of those proto cocktails like toddies, slings, cobblers. I think once you've gotten down like the main cocktails, like the old fashioned Manhattan martini, and you're starting to branch out into more of those complex cocktails that came about in the golden age of cocktails, as opposed to right at the very beginning, it's also kind of cool to like flip on the other side of the timeline to just before cocktails really came about. And you can learn a lot that way, I think. Yeah. How, what a fun time period to imagine. <laughs> right. It's such a weird time in history, uh, especially in America. There's a lot of stuff going on and not, not all of it was great, but, uh, you know, the, the stories are really good. So um, is there any other sherry related facts or points of interest that you might want to mention before we jump into the lightning round? I'm sure. I just, I, I don't know. I'm better when you ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so what I will say is uh, I know that we have a s- substantial uh, listening audience that is not located in D.C. and is you know even international. So I don't really have a, a ton of advice, but we do have a, 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 another substantial group of people who are listening here in the D.C. area. And I know that when I look for sherry, I go to a place called Schneider's of Capitol Hill. They are an excellent liquor store. They're very helpful. They're well staffed. And the people who are there know what they're talking about. Um, Mm -hmm. so, uh, that is one recommendation I have. Is there any, you don't have to make any recommendations because I understand that you're in the industry and this could perhaps have, you know, ramifications, but, um, any, any that you want to mention that, you know, might be at other parts of the city? Yeah. Well, you can always go to Gran Cata and Shaw. They, they're, um, these two guys opened their wine store a little over a year ago and they always have sherry. Typically like I think La Gitana and Alexandro, they have their, I know they always seem to have sherry at Batch 13 on 14th Street. Typically the Alexandro line again. Um, so, I mean, as many places as I can think of, I would share. Just those are the two that I think of yeah. right now. Yeah, <laughs> those are great. And then Gran, Gran Cata is a, is a great liquor store. I've, I've been in there. Um, those guys are, and they're really, really uh, fun, fun people. And they, mm-hmm. they, they'll talk you up. So, um, great. Let's jump into the lightning round. Okay. All right. First question is, uh, what is your favorite cocktail of all time? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, because that's a tough thing to do, uh, what's something that you've been more obsessed with recently? Okay, that is a tough question. I would say that it kind of revolves around these these aromatically stirred types of drinks, which include a, a dry martini, which include something called a trinity or a jungle, and those are equal parts gin, vermouth, and sherry. Um, and that I have, I return to those all the time. And they're all, you know, cousins of the martini and the Negroni, essentially. 
Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I too find myself, you know, in those, you know, messing around with a ratio. Uh, my favorite is like the last word ratio where it's mm -hmm. a one to one to one to one and there's got to be some acidity and there's got to be some funky herbal stuff in there too but then there's still room to swap things out and kind of experiment great if you were a cocktail tool or ingredient what would you be and why okay <laughs> i'd like to think i would be the mixing glass because all sorts of different things go in but it always comes out in a nice lovely different form that is always delicious okay <laughs> Interesting. You are you are the structure that uh, brings order to the chaos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that I there's more to just having one simple use, and there's more variety. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. That's that's great. Uh, if you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who w would that person be? Where would you go? What would you talk about? Just paint us uh, a picture. Also a good question because several people came into my mind, mostly because I mentioned earlier my cocktail program is literary based. So I'll read a book and then I'll create a cocktail program mm. based on the inspiration of that book. So I think about authors a lot mm. after having read their book, go, huh, interesting. Maybe it would be a cool conversation to have. And so there's a few in my head that do include uh, people like Edgar Allan Poe because there's so much mystery surrounded by him Ooh. but also more contemporary like J.K. Rowling because of course she seems really cool and down to earth and who wouldn't want to have a cocktail with her in addition there's a, a recent author I read that just the book was so overpowering and like reading a little bit about her background was so fascinating and I feel like there, maybe there were more connections she just seemed you, her name is Hanya Yanagahara and she's a pretty cool like I think she's an editor of the New York Times style magazine and she came out with a book called A Little Life which I mean I recommend it's a real hard read <laughs> but all the emotions went into it and it was hard not to have a zillion thoughts and I'm like oh she's living she's around she's got this background and has lived in as a lot of similar places like she has background and family from some of the places that I've also lived. And I'm like, I don't know. I feel like we could connect. Okay. <laughs> what I, I recently came across this author in this book. What is the book about just oh. generally? <laughs> it's, it's about a group of friends, these four guys and their, how, and their backgrounds having met and how they grow up together and some very devastating past experiences. And it's, it's a hard book. Does it go the span of their life? Uh, or of like decades it goes decades yeah i mean yes i, I don't want to give away too no, much no don't yeah, yeah <laughs> like, interesting okay i i'm just trying to figure out where i came across it uh but you did mention edgar Allan poe and it's <laughs> fitting because he has a short story called the cask, the cask of amontillado, of amontillado. Uh, <laughs> there's also so many fun like mysteries as to he seemed to be very predictive like wrote stories before they happened in history and after he was dead and like ah. there's cool things surrounding the mystery of him and yes also clearly a fan of sherry so it's hard not to think about him as oh maybe that would be a good conversation but who knows it's hard to imagine it also because i just feel like such a different human being than whoever he was at that time but yes. i like the idea of it being possible i also heard that, <laughs> that edgar Allan poe's poetry had like a real strong influence on the French surrealists like Baudelaire mm. and Rimbaud definitely who he, also kind of shared his alcoholic and substance propensities. abusing yeah well yeah and in fact there's so few authors today that don't somehow think back to how he actually influenced so many different types of literature from like the crime novel to the macabre to like to pleasant fantastical to i mean yeah the little poems i read a lot of of edgar Allan poe last year i've actually used some of his stories for two different nights so it's just so much actually yeah there's a lot of gotta be a lot of good conversation in there since we brought it up can you just put a little plug in for literary cocktails right now of course come by the literary cocktails as a session i do on fridays and saturdays in the reading room of petworth citizen um, the hours go from seven to midnight and essentially I create a different menu every weekend based on a book that I'll read throughout that week and get inspired from. Sherry makes it into a lot of cocktails, as do as does Madeira and other spirits. Um, it's just constantly changing. It stays kind of seasonal. It's a really cute room. The room itself is a functional lending library, so all the, the walls are lined with books that have been donated so people can wander in, grab a book if they want, leave a book if they want. Yeah. It is, a, it is a very, very pretty room, and 
Um, you know, the Petworth Citizen, just in general, is a great bar here in Petworth on Upshur Street. And uh, you'll occasionally you'll throw in a, a little absinthe fountain, right? Oh, right, yeah. So we do other projects back in the reading room, too. Um, whenever there's a fifth Thursday in a month, we... My um, cohort, Dan Searing, and I come together to do fifth column Thursdays, which hmm. is actually happening next week. Right. But um, it just means we take out our absinthe fountain and we feature several absinths. You can have like a standard service um, with a drip fountain with a sugar cube or other sweetener and also absinthe cocktails. And we rotate those. Nice. Well, always something cool going on when you are in the reading room. So I definitely recommend folks come out and uh, just try out some of those cocktails. And there's always, you know, it's not just the cocktail, right? But also the story behind the cocktail. And the, right. <laughs> and instead of it just being like a story of how this cocktail came, there's a literal written down in print story that influenced the cocktail. Yeah. So, all right. A couple of things, a couple pieces of advice, and then we'll, uh, we'll let you get ready for service here. But, um, I was wondering if there's any books about Sherry uh, that are particularly influential um, that maybe uh, our listeners can check out if they're inspired by some of the things we're talking about. Oh, definitely. There's so many books. Um, the two that I find myself recommending the most are uh, one is a little more recent than the other. Uh, Talia Baiocchi's, I think it's like called Sherry, The Modern Guide to World, the Wine World's Best Kept Secret. And it's got great photos and it's super great as an introductory you can read along you can see her story and her passion and it also comes with cocktails in addition to that and then the more heady the more um really great info book it's called uh sherry manzania and montilla and that's by peter leem and jesus barkeem and that's that's the one that you can really nerd out on and mm. they give you so much good information it is unfortunately harder to get but yeah those two are my my mainstays. Okay. We'll definitely link to those in the show notes. So if uh, you'd like to find some links to those, whether it's to an actual, you know, Amazon available book, or if it's, you know, if, if the other one's a little bit more difficult to, uh, to find, we'll also try and find a place, even if that's eBay, where you can uh, maybe pick up a copy. Uh, so modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast and head on over to the interview show notes with uh, Chantal Singh. And then last question here. If you could give any piece of advice to somebody who's just starting to learn about or experiment with sherry or cocktails in general, I suppose, what piece of advice would you give? The advice would be to definitely ask me about which sherries to try to start off. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. But um, food. <laughs> food is always the best way to first encounter sherry. My first experience having had dry sherry was actually not a good one. I remember trying um, a very dry manzanilla, which... By the way, I happen to love today. It's my spirit drink, really. And kind of just going, I don't get this. It doesn't make any sense. It didn't work for my palate. And then it just over time evolved. And I realized, oh, I, I really get this and I love this. But I think the first experience oftentimes is kind of think of it. All sherry is wine at the end of the day. And what goes so well when you're having wine? Snacks, olive, cheese, just other foods in general. What's nice about sherry is that it's extremely food pairing friendly. Mm. I mean, there's a reason why chefs cook with sherry it goes well right in food right <laughs> yeah and it's interesting like cooking sherry is actually like a derogative term right um it's a it sounds like that because well i mean you don't want to destroy really nice products when you're cooking with them sure, right sure. so but at the end of the day no one's if you're using sherry to cook with you're not putting in poison you're putting in a wine yeah good <laughs> good i'm glad that you drew that distinction uh, <laughs> and i really like the concept of scaffolding your way into a, a new spirit with something that's very familiar like food yeah uh, well, Chantal, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge about Sherry and uh, just your enthusiasm for it is really great. And it's definitely gotten me enthusiastic about it. But okay. if people wanted to ask you uh, what Sherry's they should start out with, how can they get in contact um, via social or on the Internet? Oh, right. OK. I have uh, I do have a pretty regular social media presence. My handle on Twitter and Instagram is Shinobi Paws. Okay. And um, you can always find um, updates for when I teach classes also through the Reading Room. So there's a Twitter handle at Reading Room DC, at Petworth Citizen. And then there's an Instagram just for at Petworth Citizen. 
Right. So we will link to those social media handles in the show notes. So hit those up, give them a, a little follow, and you too will be updated next time there is a fun literary cocktails night or uh, a fifth column third uh, fifth column thursdays or right yeah. there's also other wine nights and book clubs and fun things that go back on here yes and it's also located right next to the um the wow why Ac I, you mean across the street or you mean i i cannot believe i walked through this bookstore to oh, get in up here street up books. street books <laughs> damn wow that was bad yeah <laughs> so we've got a real great uh, triumvirate we have a bookstore a lending library and a public library down the street wow yeah. <laughs> There's lots of books in, in, in this little square area. So, um, Chantal. Yes. Thanks again. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, literary and sherry knowledge by Chantal Singh, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2018.